If you want to be blessed, bless the Jews. You can't be anti-Semitic and enter into the blessing of a Jew. You know, Abraham was a Jew. You can't be against the Jews and get the blessing of the Jews. Welcome to the Tipping Point Show. I'm Jimmy Evans. I want to welcome you to our new studio here in South Lake, Texas. This is our new EXO Marriage Center. In our new studio here, we have our LED wall back here that's going to be really great in the weeks to come to be able to show you all different kinds of stuff here on the wall behind me. But I'm really glad that you've joined me. I've got a special show today. I'm talking about entering into the blessing of the Jewish bloodline, what the Bible says about we as non-Jews entering into the blessing of the Jews. It's one of the greatest blessings that we have in this life. A lot of people don't know about it. It's something I've taught about for the last several years, but I've never taught it on the Tipping Point show. So I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. I'm also talking about something in the news. There is a professor at Albert Einstein College of Medicine that is saying that we need to prepare our children before birth for gender and gender change. I'll talk to you about some of the ridiculous statements that she made, some of the encouraging things that are going on right now in the United States re regarding uh, governments and states prohibiting uh, some of this trans surgery and things like that is very encouraging and some steps that you can take in that regard. I'm also answering questions uh, from our subscribers. And here's some of the questions I'm going to be answering today. What is the role of the modern day prophet? And what if a modern day prophet is wrong? Do they just get a pass? What if they are leading the church astray? That's a great question. Now, if you're not a subscriber to endtimes.com. I'm talking about a paid subscriber. If you're watching this on YouTube, become a paid subscriber because you'll get the entire Tipping Point show today. Plus you get Dr. Mark Hitchcock's podcast that comes out on Thursdays. You get all of our articles that come out through the week. We have a lot of content here and it's designed to encourage you $7 a month about lunch at McDonald's or, you know, something like or Subway or something like that. For $7 a month, you can be encouraged and informed in these critical days that we're living in. Again, I'm not talking about being a subscriber on YouTube. I hope you are a subscriber on YouTube, and I'm talking about being a paid subscriber to endtimes.com. Let me go into this, this teaching today now. And I, I said this one of the times that I brought this message. Uh, in 40 years of preaching, this would be one of the three most important messages I've ever brought. When you hear this teaching, you'll, you'll understand why. And this message is called The Power of a Bloodline Blessing. And I want, to, I want to explain to you the reason that Jesus died for us and how his death bonds us into the bloodline of the Jews. So this is what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 17. This is God to Abraham. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. And I will also give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, God cursed them, pronounced curses over them. Now this is the first man after Adam and Eve that God is pr pronouncing this kind of a blessing, not just to him, but all of his descendants after him. This is a genetic blessing. This is a bloodline blessing which is an everlasting covenant. And so it's not hard to see today that God has blessed the Jews. One of the reasons that Hitler and many others hated the Jews is of jealousy is you cannot argue with the fact that the Jews are just a, an exceptionally blessed people in spite of all the things that they've been through in history and all that, all of that. For example, there are more uh, Nobel laureates that are Jews than anybody else, you know, scientists, the tech sector in Israel. When we went to Israel in uh, last December, they were telling us the tech sector is, you know, it's, it's leading, leading the tech sectors of the world. The Jews are, they're just the mathematicians, uh, entertainment, finance, wherever you look, the Jews are just, they're in control. And again, some people say, well, you know, the bunch of Jews, you know, I mean, what, what are they doing running everything? Well, you know, I don't want to curse them. I want part of what they have. So this teaching today is talking about how we can enter into the bloodline blessing of Abraham. The blessing that God gave Abraham in Genesis 17 is now available to us who are non-Jews. This is what the Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 13. He says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so Paul is saying there, 
Jesus became a curse for us that the blessing of Abraham could come upon the Gentiles, non-Jews. That the blessing of Abraham could come upon the Gentiles. So say, what is the blessing of Abraham? Genesis 24, 1. This is the blessing of Abraham. Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Now that's what you want for your children. When your children are born, you want them to live a long life and you want them to be blessed in every way. The blessing of Abraham is the full blessing of God in every area of our life. So because of Jesus' death on the cross, the bloodline blessing of Abraham is now available to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews who receive Jesus. And if you're a believer, this is yours. Okay, Many people don't know about this. And many people, we leave a lot uh, many times as believers, and we live non-blessed lives, in some cases cursed lives, even though we're on our way to heaven, even though Jesus has done this for us. This is Isaiah 53, 5. It says, this is talking about Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes were healed. The word peace there is the Hebrew word shalom. And the word shalom means the total well-being of God. Total well-being. When someone greets you and says shalom, that means total, the, the total blessing of God be upon you. And so the purpose of Jesus' death was to remove the complete curse of sin from the human race and attach us to the bloodline blessing of Abraham. Well, that's just extremely good news. But here's the bad news. Many believers are carrying bloodline curses in their bodies that have been passed on for generations. Many of you who are listening to me right now, you have a curse in your family. You have something uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, and financially. In some way, there's something in your family that's been passed on from generation to generation. A lot of people think, well, isn't that normal? It, it is normal. The last time I brought this message, and I'm going to pray for you at the end of this message to break whatever issues there are in your life and family. The last time I brought this message, it was was probably about 2,000 people I was speaking to. And I said to this group at the end of this message, I said, "If if you have a bloodline curse that you would like to break, I want you to stand up and I'm going to pray for you. I think everybody stood up. If there wasn't anybody standing up, I didn't see who they were. Everybody stands up. So this is something that we can all relate to. And that's why I say in 40 years of preaching, this has got to be one of the top three messages I've ever brought as it relates to importance and just affecting every single one of us in a very tangible way. And so bloodline means genetically transferred. So uh, my doc, my family and I, my, my mom and my dad and my brothers and I, we all went to the same doctor for years. And uh, my father died of cancer. Uh, He had six cancers that killed him over about a 15-year period of time. He fought cancer for 15 years. Ultimately succumbed to it. When he died, he had uh, four cancers in his body. And the doctor looked at me and said, you know, you're predisposed toward cancer. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. Uh, Blindness, heart disease, mental problems, deafness, blood disease, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, muscular dystrophy, diabetes, birth defects, crippling arthritis, whatever it might be. Many, many other things. Uh, premature death, poverty. Those are kinds of things that people many times have running in their family. And they don't think there's anything they can do about it because it's in their bloodline. They feel like they're living with a target on their chest. And so my, my question to you is, do you really believe that Jesus became a curse for us so we could live waiting on a curse? This what that you have a target on your chest and you're just waiting for it. David Cassidy, you know, some of you are too young to remember David Cassidy, the Partridge family. Um, and his father was named Jack Cassidy. He was also an actor. And David Cassidy was uh, diagnosed with dementia at, at an early age. I think he was 60 years old when he was diagnosed with dementia. And when he was diagnosed, he said, I knew it was coming. I've been expecting it. Just waiting, waiting for the curse. Okay. This is an article from the New York Times. I want to read you. Uh, and this is about a family. It's a very sad article about a family it says, they said it was their family curse, a rare, a rare congenital deformity called syndactyly, in which the thumb and index finger are fused together on one or both hands. Ten members of the extended clan were affected, and with each new birth, they told Stefan Mundlos of the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics, the first question was always, how are the baby's hands? Are they normal? Afflicted relatives described the f- feeling like outcasts in their village, convinced that their strange fingers repulsed everybody they knew, including their unaffected kin. One woman told me that she never received a hug from her father. 
Dr. Mundlaw said he avoided her. And so this, they, that was their family. That's what the family said. This is our family curse, syndactyly. And so they have these fingers that are that are strange, and they may be able to do something about it with modern medicine. But for generations, this family they were outcasts. They were they were rejected by their own family members. Their family waiting for every baby to be born. The first question is, how are their fingers? Okay. And so um, my doctor uh, talked to me about you know, all my family predispositions. And when my doctor would talk to me, he was just being a good doctor. I love doctors. I believe in medicine. My life has been greatly blessed by the medical profession, so I never want to say anything disrespectful about doctors or medicine. My doctor was being a good doctor because it just makes sense that, you know, their genetics are passed from one generation to the other. But I don't think that way. When my doctor is talking to me and he's saying, you know, you're of the Evans bloodline, and the Evanses are predisposed toward this, that's not how I think. Now, when this teaching is over, I want to change the way you think. And here's the way I think when my doctor is talking to me. And I don't, I don't say this to him. I don't give him a lip or, you know, disrespect him. But when he's saying to me, you're predisposed toward these things, what I'm thinking to myself is, doctor, I'm not of the Evans bloodline. I'm of the Abraham bloodline. Jesus died to take away, to pay for my sin, to take away the curse of sin, and to attach me to the blessing of Abraham. That's a genetic blessing. That is a genetic blessing that God put on Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. And so what I'm saying to you is when someone's telling you that you're going to have to have this because it's in your family history, I'm saying I believe you can believe for more. I don't want you to be cavalier. I don't want you to ignore things that are happening in your body or things like that. And you need to pray about whatever you do. All I'm saying is what the Bible says. Jesus came to die for us and to take the curse away. Again, you just can't convince me now that Jesus died so we can live waiting on a curse. I just don't believe that. I believe that we can have a new bloodline because of Jesus. There was a woman, I was listening to a woman on TV one day. She was being interviewed, beautiful woman. She's probably in her mid-40s or something, very attractive woman. If you would have had the volume turned off on your TV when she was talking, you would have thought, you know, there's an attractive woman. I wonder what's wrong with her, or I wonder what she's talking about. If you turn the volume on, here's what she was saying. My grandmother and all her sisters died of breast cancer. My mother and all her sisters died of breast cancer. Both my sisters have died of breast cancer. And I have daughters. She said, in our family, we don't call them breasts. We call them bombs because we're just waiting for them to go off and kill us. Now, you think about, you think about that family. I have one side of my family where there's horrible kidney disease in this, this one side of my family. There's the sweetest people on earth, my, my family members. It's, it's my second cousins. That they're the most precious people in the world. My aunt died at like 45 years old of kidney disease and things like that. And so I had a man in, in the church that I pastored for 30 years, a very distinguished man, um, and a, a guy that I knew really well. And we were talking one day after church. He was always very distinguished. He carried himself like he was a senator or like a Supreme Court justice or something like that, just ex extremely distinguished. And he said to me one day, he said, Jimmy, I don't know if you know this, but insanity runs in my family. And he started talking to me about all the family members of his that were insane. When he said that to me, I thought to myself, this is why he carries himself the way that he does, is because I think he's trying to convince himself he's okay. And he was a very intelligent guy, very successful guy. And here's what he said, I'm concerned about my children. Insanity runs in my family. I'm concerned about my children. Well, of course he was. We had a, a marriage expert that I had on the program 20 years ago. And I was with him in Arkansas, and I was interviewing him, and we were talking. And he was in his 50s at that time. And he said, Jimmy, there's never been a man in my family lived past his 50s. I said, seriously? And he said, no. He said, we have horrible hearts. We just have terrible hearts. Many people choose not to have children because of, they want to stop the family curse. And there's a book here. I'm going to read you a part of this book here in just a minute. It's called The Kennedy Curse. Uh, the Kennedy family, and the, the subtitle of this book is Why Tragedy Has Haunted America's First Family for 150 Years. John F. Kennedy was president when I was a boy. He was assassinated when I was 10 years old. It's mathematically impossible for any family to be this unlucky. And there's a whole part in this book where they just talk about all the tragedies that have occurred to the Kennedy family. They know they're cursed. They say they're cursed. And I'm going to talk, come back here and talk about why they're cursed. But to some degree, it's true of all of our families, okay? because of generational sin, because of who knows what, in our background, it's, it's there. I mean, there is a genetic predisposition to something wrong. In some of our cases, it's horrible. 
You know, I mean, you have something, some of you are listening to this right now, you have something in your family that's just like a death sentence. And you're, you're from generation to generation, it's just you're, you're waiting for the curse. So what's the answer? Let me go back again. I want to read you again Galatians 3, and I want you to listen. I want you to decide this for yourself. I don't want to talk you into something. I want you to listen to what the Bible says. This is Galatians 3, again, verse 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, curses is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So the rest of this message, I want to talk about how to break a bloodline curse and attach to the bloodline blessing of Abraham. And the first is understand the full purpose of the cross. Now, if you ask a lot of people, why did Jesus die on the cross? They're going to say to pay for our sins. That is a correct answer. It's just incomplete. Okay. Or, or someone might say, well, Jimmy, hey, listen, Jesus came to pay for our sins and to break the curse of sin. That's also correct, but incomplete. Here's the answer, according to Galatians 3. Jesus came to pay for our sins, okay? Jesus came to break the curse of sin, and Jesus came to transfer the bloodline blessing of Abraham to us, okay? That's what the Bible says. He came to take the curse away to give us a blessing. He didn't come to take the curse away so we could have another curse. He, took, he came to take the curse completely away. So understand the full purpose of the cross. The second is surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Remember, it says that the blessing might come in Christ Jesus. The blessing of Abraham comes in Christ Jesus. And so the curse came because of rebellion. Okay? The blessing comes because we return to God's authority for our lives. Let me say this. We're saved by grace and we live by grace. We don't have to, have, we don't have to be perfect people to be blessed of God. We're not perfect people. But I want to talk about the history of Israel for just a minute, because Israel is a nation. Um, they have a blessing on them that you cannot deny, and God has not finished with them, that you can't deny that. Miracles are happening. Israel is a miracle in itself. But Israel's history was full of ups and downs, blessings and judgments and all that kind of stuff. You just read the Old Testament, and you can just see from king to king, it went from blessing to judgment to blessing to judgment based on their behavior. Here's what 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says. All these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. All the things that happened to Israel happened as examples to us so that we could learn from them about what's you know, about how to live our lives. Now, in other words, I'm going to say, the, there is a condition to the blessing. When it says that the blessing of Abraham comes upon the Gentiles, there is a condition and there is a consequence to sin. Our behavior, our behavior has consequences. You don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be perfect, but I just want to talk about some of the sins that can negate the blessing. The first of which is anti-Semitism, being against the Jews. Genesis 12, 3, God said, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. You can look at this happening in the world right now. Let me also say we're taking our Israel trip December 29th or November 29th through December the 8th. It's going to be a fantastic trip. We have a lot of people going, and we're very excited to take all of you. This is going to be a trip. Uh, Pastor Ed Young of Fellowship Church and myself, we're going to be teaching uh, throughout the nation of Israel, but at different sites. I'll be teaching a lot about prophecy. I can't wait to be on the Mount of Olives teaching about what's going to be happening there, the Valley of Megiddo, all these places. It's going to be a very, very exciting time. We want you to be a part. Go to endtimes.com, and you can just look under events there. You can find out about the Israel tour. And listen, when we go to Israel, you can go five-star. Israel's a very beautiful place, phenomenal hotels, everything. You can go five-star. Uh, we have buses for five-star people. We also have economy buses. You can choose your level there. So the price range is very, but I want you to go with us. It's going to be a fantastic time all through Israel. Seeing that it'll change the way you see the Bible. It will deepen your relationship with God. And I can't wait to meet you there endtimes.com under events, and you can sign up. We want you to be a part of this, so sign up as soon as you possibly can. Let me go back to the book, The Kennedy Curse, here for just a minute, this book right here. Okay, so Joe Kennedy was the patriarch of the Kennedys in America. Very wicked guy, very evil guy. When you look at why the Kennedys were cursed, this is not just the only reason, uh, because Patrick Kennedy came from Ireland. He was also an extremely corrupt and ungodly man. Uh, I think he was the grandfather of Joe Kennedy. So Joe Kennedy became the ambassador to England. 
uh, United States ambassador to England, and he was pro-Hitler. He was against uh, the war. He was against America and the Allied forces going to war against uh, uh, Germany, and he was sympathetic to Hitler's treatment of the Jews. Let me read you just an excerpt here of the book, The Kennedy Curse. When Harvey Klemmer returned from a trip to Germany, he gave Joe a personal briefing on how Nazi stormtroopers molested Jews in the streets, destroyed Jewish-owned businesses, and committed mayhem and murder in Jewish neighborhoods. This is his response. Well, they brought it on themselves, Joe said. Joe had nothing but contempt, contempt for the powerless Jews in Hitler's Germany who allowed themselves to be pushed around. The, ha the, the haunting fear of his own weakness rendered him incapable of seeing Hitler in moral terms. He was totally pro-Hitler and blamed the Jews for bringing it on themselves. And you say, so why are the Kennedys so cursed? That's one reason. He also became filthy rich during Prohibition by selling liquor. He, this is, he was notoriously or infamously immoral. And many of his sons were also. And so when you see this kind of behavior, God says, I'll curse him who curses you. You've never seen a great nation remain great when they come against the Jews. The book Eye to Eye, and Bill Cohen, this, this is Eye to Eye here, and this, the subtitle is Facing the Consequences of Dividing Israel. And this is talking about when America's tried to divide the land of Israel, 124 documented cases of natural, historic natural disasters that have happened. And when Bill, Bill's going to be with me here in a couple of weeks on the Tipping Point show, and he's going to bring us up to date because there's been many others. I was with him last week, and he was telling about more of the things that have been happening in America that are directly associated with this. But I'm just saying this. If you want to be blessed, bless the Jews. You can't be anti-Semitic and enter into the blessing of a Jew. You know, Abraham was a Jew. You can't be against the Jews and get the blessing of the Jews. And so we have to understand that anti-Semitism brings a curse. So we need to, many, many Christians are believe in a replacement theology. Many Christians are anti-Semitic. And I've said this, made this statement before, but Martin Luther was anti-Semitic. He was rapidly anti-Semitic. And uh, Hitler got much of his inspiration from Martin Luther. We cannot be anti-Semitic and be blessed. Here's another sin that we have to watch out for, and it's rebellion to authority. This is Romans 13. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So authority is, a, is from God. And when we resist authority, our boss at work and our parents, if you're a young person, your, your parents, the government authorities, the police, whoever it might be, we submit to authority. Jesus was submitted to authority all of his entire life. And so submission to authority is absolutely critical. We live in a rebellious world, but we have to be submitted to authority. Another sin is occultism. This is, this are, uh, you look right now at the movies that are coming out, Disney and all these kind of things, They're, they are mesmerized by the occult. But there are horrible consequences for this. Now, let me tell you a story. Um, and this happened about four or five years ago. I was a part of a prophetic presbytery service, and this was in the church that I used to pastor. And there was a couple. The, this is where the leaders are praying for people as they're being set into leadership. And uh, they were praying over this couple. Well, as they were praying over this couple, in the spirit, I, I saw the Lord walk up and grab this woman's face and start talking to her. And um, I, it just kind of surprised me. And the Lord said to me, I want you to walk up and I want you to hold this woman's face and I want you to tell her what, what I tell you to say. I walked up after a little bit and I, I asked her for permission, you know, if I could touch her face. I held her face. And here's what I said to her. I said, you came out of generations of darkness and your family, but you fought and you came out. And here's what the Lord wants you to know. It will never happen to you and your children. Well, she starts crying. So I walked back over and sat down. I didn't know what I had said. I had no idea. And so after the service was over, the, the couple, the man and wife, came and found me. These are precious people. And they came and found me. And she said to me, do you want to know what you said? And I said, yes, I would love to know what I said. And she said, I came out of generations of occultism in my family. And she said, when, when we got married, we decided we were not going to be a part of that any longer. And we were going to come out of it. She said, we became Christians. We got out of that lifestyle, whatever. And here's what she said. There's never been a firstborn male child in our family live past the age of 18. And my son turned 17 this year. 
And when he turned 17, she said, I was walking at the park last week and the devil came and told me he was going to take my son away from me. And here's what I said to that woman. You, came, you come out of generations of darkness and the Lord wants you to know it won't happen to you and your children. Now that boy is now 25 years old. The first son, the first firstborn son in their family history that she knew of that lived past the age of 18. So again, I say when family sins can bring curses, there's an example right there. The occult, the occult is death. This is something that God hates. And I'm talking about the history of Israel. You look at Israel, rebellion against God, involvement in the occult. Even Solomon built altars to the horrific gods of Molech and all these different gods that the, he built uh, idols to or altars to because of his wives that were not believers. They were uh, pagan wives. And so involvement in the occult is absolutely death. It's anathema. Pastor Jimmy Witcher, uh, the weekend that I brought this message at Trinity in Amarillo, Pastor Jimmy Witcher told about 30 young people, I believe this was an experiment, where 30 young people all uh, did a Ouija board together at the same time. And they, they did this Ouija board. All 30 young people were rushed to the hospital suffering from panic attacks. And so if you don't think that occultism, it opens the door for evil and for the devil, you don't know about occultism. The devil is not, he doesn't play nice. He wants to seal, kill, and destroy. And the occult lets him in. Uh, another one, another sin that we have to be careful of is a lifestyle of sexual immorality. Again, we're not perfect. We all, we're, none of us are perfect. All of us sin. But I'm talking here about a lifestyle of sin. This is Revelation 2. Now, this is Jesus t talking to a church. Now, I want you to remember when we're reading this now, that this is Jesus talking to a local church, an actual church. Here's what he says. To the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, his feet are like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality, and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation until, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Remember, if you've read the Old Testament about Israel and all of their, when Moses was up on the Mount, Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments, they're down having an uh, orgy, having a big sex party. And Moses comes down this way threw the tablets down. And so sexual immorality cursed Israel, and it curses people. Again, we don't have to be perfect to be blessed. But a lot of people, and they say, well, we, we, we're under grace in the New Testament. That was Jesus in the New Testament saying that to the church at Thyatira. That was Jesus. All of us commit sins, but there's a difference between committing and practicing. And that's what Jesus said. You allow that woman Jezebel to come in and teach my people to practice sexual immorality. And so if we have sin in our lives, all of us sin. And every day when we pray, we pray, Lord, forgive me my sins as I forgive those who sinned against me. It's a daily prayer. We, we do business every day. God forgives us. He's a gracious God. But it's a different thing to take sin, a sin especially sexual immorality, and baptize it and call it holy and not to be repentant at all. This was what cursed Israel, and it also curses many believers today. And the fifth one, the final one, and I'm going to pray for you, is hate and unforgiveness. Now, Jesus, in Matthew 18, he told a story. Peter actually came to Jesus and said to him, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Seven. Probably some of the other disciples were on his nerves, and he was asking Jesus, you know, when, when can I kill these guys? And Jesus, he said seven times, and Jesus said 70 times seven. And then Jesus told a totally ridiculous story. And he said there was a man who had a master, and he owed his master a billion dollars. That this, this was billions of dollars that Jesus said he owed him. And the man couldn't repay. The master demanded that he be turned over to the debt collectors until he repaid. And the, and the man begged his master for forgiveness, and the master forgave him. As incredible as that sounds, he forgave him all that debt. And then after being forgiven, he went and found a fellow servant that owed him $10,000 and demanded his money. And when the man wouldn't pay him, he began to beat him and demand that he be paid back. Well, one of the fellow servants saw it and went and told the master. And that this, is, this is verse 32 now, Matthew 18. Here's how Jesus responds. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not have also had compassion on your fellow servant, 
just as I had pity on you. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. Listen to this sentence. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Well, our forgiveness is conditional. That's what Jesus was talking about there. We, God will give us as much grace as we give away. We can't receive grace and give away justice. We can't do that. We have to give away the same grace that God gives us. And so you say, well, you know, Jimmy, you don't know what people have done to me. Well, let me tell you what you did. You killed Jesus. I killed Jesus. Our sins put our Lord on the cross. The most righteous man in the history of the world was killed because of you and was killed because of me. We owed God a billion dollars, billions of dollars that we could never repay because of what we did to Jesus Christ. He sent Jesus to die for us, to take the curse of our sin away, to attach us to the bloodline blessing of Abraham. And all he expects of us is for us to forgive other people. And when we, when we want grace from God and justice for everybody else, it blocks the button. Not saying you're not going to heaven. I'm not saying you don't love Jesus. I'm just saying you will not be as blessed as you want to be. He says, so God will do, so my father will do to each of you. He's talking to the disciples. If from your heart, you don't forgive your brother, your trespasses. Let me say, Luke 6, 28 says, bless those who curse you. That's how you forgive from your heart. You bless people, the people that have done you wrong. And, and you say, well, how can I bless someone who molested me on my life? How can I bless somebody who killed a family member? Jesus hung on the cross and forgave the people who put him there. And blessing for, forces forgiveness from your head to your heart. And blessing is what heals your heart. If you're full of bitterness, some people say, well, Jimmy, I've forgiven this person a thousand times, nothing changed. It won't until you bless them. But when you start blessing them, it will heal your heart and it proves to God that you're forgiving from your heart. Let me say it another way. If you can't bless them, you're not forgiving them. And so and I know I've done this personally. For people I hated their guts. I've done this personally. I've experienced the healing that comes and the blessing that comes for forgiving from your heart. So anti-Semitism, rebellion to authority, involvement in the occult, a lifestyle of sexual immorality, hate and unforgiveness. Those are the big five right there. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We, we're saved by grace. We live by grace. But when we willfully sin in those areas there, this is what happened to Israel. This is what happens to us. It blocks the blessing. Here's the third step now in breaking the, the curses and attaching ourselves to the bloodline blessing, and that is we break, the, we break the curse in the name of Jesus, and we change bloodlines. This is what we do. I break the curse in Jesus' name, and I change bloodlines. So here, here's what I want to lead you in a prayer of doing. I don't know what your name is. Um, I don't know exactly who your family is. You, you know all about your family. You know all about the predispositions of your family. You may be experiencing some of those things right now. We're going to renounce the curse of your bloodline, and we're going to change bloodlines. This is what I'm encouraging you to bless your family, forgive your family, no ill will toward anyone. But all I'm saying is you're no longer of that, that, that bloodline. That's not your bloodline. You're Because of Jesus, Galatians 3 says, we're now of the bloodline of Abraham. And so I want you to stop waiting on the curse. I want you to stop waiting for the, for the, the target on your chest for the curse to come to you and to your children. I want you to believe for you, your children, your grandchildren, from this day forward, we're, we're of a different, I, I pray this every day. I pray this every day over myself and my family, all of my loved ones, and I just say, Lord, I receive again today the blessing of Abraham. I am expecting blessing. I don't have a target on my chest waiting for the curse of the Evans bloodline or any bloodline I'm a part of. Because of Jesus, I expect a blessing. And I want you to do the same thing. So I want to pray for you right now. And I want you just to think about your, your family and any of the predispositions of your family. And we're going to break those right now. And we're going to attach ourselves to the blessing of Abraham. Lord, right now I come on behalf of all my brothers and sisters, all my friends watching right now. Lord, we believe that you came to pay for our sins. We believe that you came to remove the curse of our sins and to attach us to the bloodline blessing of Abraham. And Lord, we renounce the curse of our family bloodline in Jesus name. We declare it will no longer have any authority over us for us, our children, our grandchildren, all generations. And now Lord, we attach ourselves to the bloodline of Abraham by faith. Lord, in Christ Jesus, we surrender to your authority. We repent of our sins, whatever sins we've committed, Lord, we, we ask you for your forgiveness and we, Know that you've forgiven us, Lord. 
But by faith right now, we attach ourselves to the bloodline blessing of Abraham and we declare we are forgiven of our sins. All of the curse of sin has been removed from us. And from this moment forward, we are a part of the bloodline blessing of Abraham. And I believe that for myself and all of my friends watching right now. And I pray for the physical manifestation of this to appear in their bodies, in their minds, in their spirits, in their families, in their children, in their grandchildren. We're believing for the physical, full manifestation in their finances, in their marriages, in their relationships. We're praying for the full manifestation of the blessing of Abraham, and we are expecting to live long lives and to be blessed in all ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, that's a, that's a, that's a life-changing uh, prayer uh, that a lot of you just prayed there. I, I brought this message one time, and a young lady came up to me after the service. Uh, this was recently, you know, a month or so ago. And she said to me, I've been sick all my life, and I'm sick right now. She's probably 40 years old. She said, I've been sick all my life, and I'm sick right now. She said, my mother was sick all of her life, and she's sick right now. And she said, my son is sick all the time, and he's sick right now. And she said, this, this message has changed my life. And what I said to her is, I said, you have a spirit of infirmity. And that spirit of infirmity has come to you generation after generation. And I, I taught her, just standing there talking to her, I taught her um, how to speak to that spirit because it's an entity. It's not, it wasn't a part of her. It was an entity. I said, from now on, you don't let that entity attach itself to you. And you, believe, you begin to believe now for the total blessing of Abraham. This, this is a life changing message. And I pray that it is a blessing to you. You might want to share it with other people. Uh, tell them if you're a YouTube watcher, tell them to watch this on YouTube or whatever, or forward it to them. And my prayer is that it has the full effect of blessing you. We're going to go now to the subscriber only portion of the program where I'm talking about what's in the news and answering questions. I want you to become a subscriber of endtimes.com. This is not just a subscriber of YouTube. It's a paid subscriber of endtimes.com so you can get the entire podcast, $7 a month or $77 a year. I want you to be a subscriber. And But if you are a YouTube viewer, God bless you. We'll see you next time. 